Hello, everybody. Hello. Hi, everyone. Uh, I am Vadim Tusko. I am a lead developer at platform team at Одноклассники. And I'm Ilya Kokorin. I am a researcher at the at Edmond University. Uh -huh. So uh, you're also a teacher of uh, programming and distributed yeah. systems yeah. course. And your research... I'm a, I'm a junior uh, teacher. The lead teacher is Roman Yelizarov. Wow, cool. I know him. <laughs> He's a really cool guy. And your research focuses primarily on uh, concurrent and uh, distributed data structures. Right? Yeah, and parallel, parallel budget ones. Uh -huh. We will talk about them today. Uh -huh, cool. So uh, as far as I know, usually there are two types of storages uh, for transactional processing and for analytical processing. And actually, they store the same, da the same data. Yeah. And uh, you are going to talk about hybrid transactional and analytical processing. Yeah. Right? Yeah, we'll discuss different solutions about uh, about using different storages mm -hmm. for that purpose, about using one storage for that purpose. Cool. Uh, so today I'm going... Uh, so, so I think I'm a start. So as I've, as I've said, my name is Ilya, and today we're going to talk about HTAP workloads. Challenges such workloads pose on our data structures and about solutions we might use to overcome such challenges. Uh, f uh, before before we begin discussing uh, HTAP workloads, let us recall other types of possible database workloads. First of all, I begin with a small disclaimer. Uh, during the talk, I will illustrate uh, different queries in a SQL language. However, the ideas from this talk may be applied to different uh, th they may be applied to different data storage, even uh, those that do not use SQL as a primary query language. So, the first type of possible database workload is OLTP, or Online Transaction Processing. Such transactions touch only a few rows. They executed on behalf of a user to show or to modify some user data. For example, consider some messenger application, and of course, that messenger should have a database. And of course, the database will store sent messages. So when a user types a message and clicks send, we insert new message to the database, like uh, here on the slide. And uh, the user may a user may want to change a content of some message, for example, to change its text. So uh, we may change a text of one message. So both these queries. Uh, affect only one message, so they are definitely all TP queries. And they should have reasonable latency, because users don't like to wait, because when user types a message and clicks send, he doesn't want for the he doesn't want to wait for like 10 minutes for the database to process its message. And uh, for such queries, throughput really matters because we can have millions of users or even more that are executing uh, tens of millions of requests per second or even more. So let us switch to the other type of database workload. It's called OLAP, or Online Analytical Processing. Such queries calculate some statistical aggregation over a lot of rows. Let us consider the example here. Suppose we have a database that stores data from some ad advertising system, and we store clicks, uh, and we have a table that stores clicks on advertisements. Uh, what do we do here? Here we fetch all clicks made during the last month, and for each advertisement, we count the number of clicks made on it. And finally, we select top 10 advertisements by the clicks count. Uh, so uh, this query reads a lot of rows because we read all uh, clicks during the last month. And if in the high load advertising system, it can be billions of clicks or even more. Such queries are read only. Today, we will not be discussing batch update requests. And usually, not always, but usually, all up queries are executed on behalf of a data analyst. Thus, high throughput is not required because we can't have millions of data analysts in our company. In that case, uh, a single OLAP query can use a lot of resources, like it can use multiple CPU cores, it can use a lot of memory, it can use a lot of network and disk bandwidth. However, such queries should complete within seconds or minutes, not hours. They should be almost real time because if uh, so if an OLAP query takes multiple hours to execute, then our data analyt analytics will not be able to check a lot of hypotheses about our data, and our data understanding will be very poor. And, uh, how, however, this is not always the case that, our, that OLAP queries are executed on behalf of a data analyst. We may have a situations when OLAP queries are executed on behalf of an ordinary user. Uh, in this case, where uh, high throughput is required. So what is HTAP? HTAP is basically a combination of OLTP transactions and OLAP queries. 
Let us see what happens when we try to execute all up cores on a system running OTP transactions. We may face two types of issues, one being concurrency issues and the second being data layout issues. Let us begin with concurrency issues first. Uh, before we begin talking about concurrency issues, let me remind you of the basics of concurrency control in database. Before we read some database row, we acquire a read lock on it. Before we modify some database row, we acquire a write lock on it. And read locks can be shared with other readers. Write locks are exclusive and can be shared with anyone. Today we will not be considering more complex locks, right? like range locks, page locks, index locks. And to guarantee correctness of multiple transactions, multiple concurrent transactions, Databases use uh, so-called two-phase locking protocol. According to the protocol, each transaction is divided into two phases. During the first phase, we may acquire locks and execute transaction logic, like we may read rows, write rows, do some computations, but we cannot release the locks we hold. Eventually, we decide that our transaction should be committed or rolled back. And this is when the second phase starts. During the, phase, uh, during the second phase, we only release all the locks we have acquired, so we don't... Uh, we, we don't uh, acquire locks anymore, we don't execute transaction logic, we don't do writes, we don't do reads, we don't do computations, we only release all the locks. So, let us see what happens when we have uh, when we combine both OLTP and the lock workload in our system. Here we have uh, uh, the OLAP query, here we have OLTP transaction, and uh, multiple database rows. And oh, the problem is, uh, what, what is the problem? Suppose uh, the first, suppose the OLAP query wants to read the first row, it redlocks it. It wants to read the, the second row, it redlocks it. It wants to read the third row, it redlocks it. And this is when the OLTP transaction wants to write the last row and it write locks it. Uh, as after that, the OLTP transaction wants to write the third row, it tries to write lock it, but it cannot do so because the third row has been already redlocked by the OLAP query. And write locks are exclusive, they cannot be shared. So, uh, in this case, the OLTP transaction has to wait until uh, the OLAP query is completed, which may take tens of seconds, making the user wait for too long. Consider a situation when you cannot, uh, for example, change some data of yours in, uh, uh, that is stored by our servers, because uh, some, OLAP some analytical query is running. Uh, it's, it's, of course, bad. It's bad, but can things go even worse? In a database world, uh, things always can go uh, worse. Uh, we can face a deadlock here. Consider a situation when uh, OLAP query wants to read the last row. It tries to redlock it, but it cannot do so because it has already been write-locked by the OLTP transaction. And uh, uh, so, so we clearly have a deadlock because we have a cycle in our await graph. OLAP the OLAP query waits for the OLTP transaction to release the uh, the last row, and the OLTP transaction waits for the OLAP query to release the third row. So they are awaiting for each other, so we have a cycle in our awaitance graph, and we have a deadlock here. Uh, deadlocks are costly in a concurrent system because we should detect this deadlock. We, and both transactions can't proceed, so we should roll back one of the transactions. Uh, after that, we have to retry the transaction we have rolled back, thus increasing its latency. So, so it's it's kind of terrible. And one may say, yeah, this is bad, but we have the same problems when running only OLTP transactions in the system. Yeah, I say that's true, but when we add all up cores to the system, the probability of such situation dramatically increases. Uh, note that when our transaction holds a lot of locks, we increase the probability that some other transaction will want to acquire one of the locks we hold, thus causing a conflict. A conflict is a situation when Either uh, write transaction is blocked is blocked by analytical read, or uh, a or a deadlock. And when our transaction holds some lock for a long time, we increase the probability that some other transaction will want to acquire the lock we hold. That's yet again causing a conflict. And all our queries do both these things. They acquire a lot of locks because they read a lot of rows and they hold that locks for a long time because they uh, they can take tens of seconds to execute or even minutes. So uh, OLAP queries incre dramatically increases the probability of a conflict in our system. Uh, let us see how we can deal with that situation. We want to design a solution in which read queries will not block uh, write transactions from uh, proceeding. Uh, so, one naive approach that we may consider is reading without locks. 
readers will, will uh, read without taking logs, so readers will not prevent writers from writing. Yeah, uh, sounds promising, but the problem is that reads without logs may not be consistent. Consider the example here. We have two bank accounts, account A holding 100 coins, account B holding 0 coins, and two transactions. The first transaction transfers all coins from account A to account B, the second transaction reads A and B balance. Let's see what can happen. The first transaction withdraws 100 coins from account A to account B. After that, the second transaction reads A balance. It can do so, nobody can prevent it, because we read without logs. As I said, we read uh, account, uh, we read uh, balance of account B and it's zero. So balance of account B is zero and balance of account A is zero. So it seems that we have lost our money. So uh, we had 100 coins before transfer and now we have zero coins. So from the second transaction point of view, we have lost uh, ma all money in the system because the second, the second transaction faced a consistent view of the database. We may come up with um, uh, different uh, s solutions. For example, we may use so-called immediate release approach. We may try to release the read lock immediately after reading the corresponding row without waiting, waiting for the second phase of the two-phase locking protocol. Consider the example here. The, uh, to the topmost peak depicts the, uh, uh, the two-phase locking protocol. First, we acquire a read lock. After that, we read uh, a row. And only during the second phase, we release the read lock on that row. However, we may try to release uh, the read lock immediately after the row, after we have read the row, without waiting for the second phase. However, uh, write locks are still released in the second phase, and in relational databases, it is called, it is well known as the read uncommitted approach. But the problem is that uh, it doesn't guarantee that we will fa we will face um, only consistent views. Uh, and it can be easily shown. So we should design solutions that will guarantee that we will always face only consistent, uh, only consistent views of the database. And persistent data structures can, ha can help us. A data structure is called persistent. If it is, um, uh, a data structure is called persistent. If modification operations do not modify the data structure itself. Instead, modification operation create a new version of a data structure. So consider the example here. Here we have um, a binary search tree, and we want to insert new key f to the tree. And instead of modifying the existing tree, we create a new version of the tree with key f inserted. New version shares uh, some of its nodes with the existing version, like nodes A, C, and D are shared between versions. And persistent trees are well known because um, uh, because it's easy to implement a persistent tree. We should just copy each node on the path from the root to the modified node. So here, we copy each node on the path from the root to a new node f. So we copy two nodes, root and b. And we shall store the whole database in a single persistent data structure. So we can store all the database in a collection of persistent trees. Like we can store both tables, indexes, and whatever we have in our database. Let us see how we can use such as persistent trees to implement our database. We will store a pointer to the current version of the data structure in a single variable. For example, if our data structure is a persistent tree, we can store a pointer to the root of the current version of the tree. Let us see how we can implement uh, read-only queries on such construction. Uh, first, we read the uh, first we acquire the current version of the data structure by reading the uh, the, the, the root pointer. After that, we can execute arbitrary read-only logic on the, on the acquired version, no matter how complex it is, because our data structure is persistent, we don't have to worry that some other transaction will modify uh, our, our, our database and we will face some inconsistent views. Data structure is persistent, so nobody modifies. Uh, write queries are a bit more complex, let us see how we can implement them. First, we acquire the current version by reading the root pointer. After that, we obtain the new version by applying the modification operation. And after that, we use compare and swap to try to automatically change, uh, replace the current version with a new one. If the cast succeeds, it means that we have successfully applied our modification operation. But if it fails, it means that some other transaction has changed uh, the version, and we should retry the whole operation from the very beginning. Yeah. So this approach uh, is called uh, universal construction, and it guarantees serializability of our transaction. It, and read-only transaction will be serialized when they read the root pointer, write transaction are serialized when uh, the cast succeeds, and in, moreover, in this approach, nor, neither 
readers, block writers, nor writers block readers. So it sounds very promising, but it has a major problem. Consider this example here. Suppose we have a binary search tree and we have two uh, transactions. The first wants to insert key two to the data structure and the second wants to remove key seven from the tree. Let us see what can happen. The first transaction acquires current version of the data structure. The second transaction acquires current version of the tree. After that, the first transaction acquires, uh, obtains new version of the tree with key two inserted to the tree and uses CAS to try to replace the current version of the data structure with a new one, and it succeeds. So now the root pointer points to the new version of the data structure. And uh, this first transaction is completed. After that, the second transaction uh, obtains a new version of the, of the data structure with key 7 removed from the tree. And after that, uh, it, uh, it uses cast to try to replace the current version with a new one, but it fails because the version has already been modified, been changed by the first transaction. And the second transaction has to retrace from the very beginning. So the problem is the following. Suppose we have multiple concurrent modifying operations and only one of them can be executed successfully because other will face unsuccessful cast and have to retry. Thus, all modifications are applied sequentially, and the throughput of the resulting construction is very low. And this construction almost does not scale, because uh, when we add more cores, more CPUs to the system, the throughput does not increase. Let us see what we can do with such a situation. We can use parallel batching technique. What is parallel batching technique? Instead of applying single value updates to the system, like insert a single key to the tree, or remove a single key from the tree, we will apply a batch update to the system, like insert a sort sorted batch of keys to the tree or remove a sorted batch of keys to the tree. Let us see how we can insert a sorted batch of keys to the tree efficiently. Uh, we have a tree here. We have the left subtree, uh, the root, the right subtree. All keys uh, in the left subtree are less than the root value. All keys in the right subtree are greater than the root value. And we have a sorted batch of keys that we should insert to the tree. So some keys that are less than the uh, root value should be inserted to the left subtree, while some keys that are greater than the root value should be inserted to the right subtree. We can find the separation point in the batch. All keys left from the separation point must be inserted to the left subtree. All keys right to the separation point must be inserted to the right subtree. We can find the separation point because our batch is sorted. And, um, and uh, uh, we can find the separation point with a single binary search. It's easy. So after that, we insert uh, all the necessary keys to the left subtree and all the necessary keys to the right subtree in parallel, leveraging the fact that our uh, machine has multiple CPUs or multiple CPU cores. The insertion is recursive, so uh, the procedure is the same for left and right subtree. And what happens after? Our tree is still persistent, so insertion doesn't modify uh, left and right subtrees. Uh, left and right subtrees. But we obtain the new version of the left subtree with all the necessary keys inserted and new version of the right subtree with all the necessary keys inserted. After that, uh, we have new version of the left subtree, new version of the right subtree, and the root. And we can merge them to form the resulting tree. And merge can be done in logarithmic time in uh, many existing data structures, like in AVL trees, play trees, trips, and etc. And it seems that we have solved the problem. But we have another problem here, because in real world, uh, in real world system updates usually don't come in large batches. Instead, we have an endless stream of single value updates. So how can we turn an endless stream of single value updates into a small number of batch updates? We apply the parallel combining technique. When the first oper update operation comes to our system, we do not execute it right now. Instead, we uh, start collecting the batch of updates. We add the first operation to the batch. We add the second operation to the batch, and after some time, the batch is collected. After that, we start applying it in parallel, leveraging uh, intra-batch parallelism. So after that, we may start collecting the second batch. We collect the first operation, we collect the second operation, and after some time, the second batch is collected. And after the second batch is collected, and after the first batch execution is finished, we may start applying the second batch. And batches are applied one after another, so there are no inter-batch concurrency. Thus, we don't face a problem we have discussed. When we have multiple concurrent modifying operations, only one of them will be executed successfully, and thus we will have to retry. We don't have concurrent modifying operations. We have batch updates applied one after another. So no concurrency here. Only parallelism. That's why parallel combining. 
and uh, let us see what happens when we increase batch size. Uh, we, we shall define additional operational latency. It's a latency between the point in time when the, uh, when, uh, the operation comes to our system and the point in time when we start applying the batch with that operation. When we increase the batch size, additional operational latency increases too because uh, we need to wait for more uh, operation. We need to wait longer. However, and uh, increasing latency is of course bad, but large batches lead to better parallelism utilization. Uh, therefore, the throughput increases too, and that's good. On the other hand, when we decrease batch size, we decrease both latency and throughput. So we, here we have a well-known latency versus throughput trade-off. And to solve this trade-off, we should carefully design a batching strategy. One possible strategy is to wait for no more than n operations and t seconds to form a batch. If we have waited for t seconds and have not collected n operations into a batch, we apply a smaller budget we already have. Uh, in this case, we keep additional operation latency reasonably low. We keep it. Uh, no, we, we say that it will be always uh, less, uh, no, no greater than t seconds. So here is a small reading list: three papers about uh, persistent parallel trees and one paper about parallel combining. Uh, so, what is the problem of such construction? Suppose we want to modify a single node, and we should copy each node on the root to the modified node. So in uh, a present trees, it's algorithmic number of nodes. So on each update, we spend a logarithmic number of copies, and that's kind of bad. Can we design a solution in which, on a single value update, we'll uh, create only one, we'll copy only one element? The solution is called a multi-version concurrency control, or MVCC. The basic idea is that updates never override data. Instead, updates create a new version of the data. Consider the example here. Here, uh, on the left, we have um, we have no MVCC database. In, in the database, we have uh, a row and uh, with key and value, and we want to change, modify a value by key. So we just modify the value in place, and that's it. However, with uh, multi-version concurrency control, we uh, create new version of the row with a uh, new value. And each row is versioned independently in contrast to the previous solution when we, ver we versioned all the database as a whole. So we store the whole database in a persistent data structure. Here, each row is versioned independently. And each row is tagged with the creation timestamp. So the first row has creation timestamp 24 and the second has creation timestamp 42. Uh, each transaction acquires monotonic and increasing timestamp before the beginning of the execution. This timestamp is called start timestamp or read timestamp, and it denotes a moment when transaction reads are performed. Timestamp for performing transaction writes will be acquired later before commit. Timestamps may be located by a centralized component. For example, we can use fetch that counter for that purpose, like here. Let us see how we handle reads. Suppose we want to read a database row at uh, some read timestamp. We select the most recent version, creation timestamp of which is less or equal than our read timestamp. Thus, we select the most recent version that existed at the read moment. Consider the example here. We have four versions of the row. And version number three and version number four are not visible for us because they did not exist at the read moment because the creation timestamp is greater than our read timestamp. The first version is outdated, and the second version is just what we need. It's the most recent version that existed at the right moment, so we return it. Uh, readers do not hold log, do not hold row logs because row versions are immutable; they are never modified, and that's good. Uh, so let, let us see how we handle transaction writes. Suppose our transaction wants to modify multiple rows, row A and row B, and start, and we have some start timestamp. We create uncommitted version of rows and set creation timestamp of such uncommitted version to be our start timestamp. We create uncommitted version of the first row, uncommitted version of the second row, and eventually we think we have, cre we have created the uncommitted version of all, of all rows we want. We may commit. Before commit, we obtain commit timestamp. We do it the same way as obtaining start timestamp, for example, using the same fashion counter. Commit timestamp denotes a moment when transaction writes are performed. How do we commit? First we, apply, first, we obtain commit timestamp, which will be greater than our start timestamp. After that, for each uncommitted version that our transaction created, we, use, we do two following things atomically. First, we set creation timestamp of the version to equal our commit timestamp instead of our start, start timestamp. And 
we mark the and the secondly we mark the version as committed like here we do both things atomically now creation timestamp equals to our commit timestamp and the version is committed we do this for the first row and we do this for the second row now our transaction is committed if you want to roll back our transaction we just we don't obtain any commit timestamp we just remove uncommitted version of all rows that we created one by one now transaction is rolled back so uh, despite the fact that we don't have read logs in MVCC, we still have write logs. And a row is considered locked when uncommitted version of a row exists. We can still read that row, but we cannot add a new version of the locked row. For example, here, we want to add, uh, we have a, our transaction with start timestamp 56, and we want to add uncommitted version of this row. But here uncommitted version already exists, so the row is locked. And we have to, and we wait for the row to be unlocked. So we wait until the transaction that created that version either commits or rollbacks, re releasing the row. If we want to create an uncommitted version of the row and see that more recent committed version of the row already exists, like here, more recent committed version of the row already exists, we should roll back our transaction because we conclude that more recent transaction has already modified the row and our transaction is outdated. So we roll back our transaction. Let us see how readers interact with uncommitted versions. Suppose we are reading a row that has been modified concurrently, thus we read a row of which row an uncommitted version exists. If the most recent visible version is committed, we just read it, because we don't have to do anything, like, um, because no read-write conflict is detected, like here. Uh, the most recent visible version is the second, and we just return it without doing anything more. But, if the most recent visible version is uncommitted, we have to wait, because we can have two possible outcomes of this situation. For example, the, uh, that transaction that created that uncommitted version may roll back. In this case, the most recent version will be the penultimate version with timestamp 56. But this transaction may commit before our read timestamp. For example, it commit at timestamp uh, 90. In this case, the resulting version will be the last with uh, the uncommitted version. So we don't have to, we don't know yet which version to return. Thus, our reader will wait. Thus, despite the fact that our readers do not block writers, our writers can still block readers. Let us see how, uh, why it is bad and what can we do with this, with this uh, drawback. Suppose we have started a, an all-up transaction, a big, 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 big read-only transaction. And uh, our transaction is blocked by some active writers. Uh, what can we do? We can, of course, wait for some time until the writers complete, but we may choose our read timestamp in the past. Like we may choose read timestamp that was actually like 10 minutes ago, 5 minutes ago, 2 minutes ago. Because the probability that some other trans writer that was active 10 seconds ago is still active is um, it's very small. It's of course less than uh, the probability that some writer that was active half a second ago is still active. So. Uh, a very small number of writers will uh, can uh, uh, can block us. Uh, so, of course, if we choose read timestamp in the past, we will read a bit stale data, like we will read data that was actual ten seconds ago. However, for most for most analytic cases, luck in the order of minutes is okay. Not for all cases, of course, but for most cases, it's okay. So we may use such a solution. And uh, note that updates only create new version of rows. And rows versions are never deleted. So our database, volume of our database grows and grows and grows constantly. We may, to reduce the size of our database, we may detect versions that are too old to be accessed, like here. Suppose a row has four versions, and version number three and version number four are recent and they can still be accessed. But version number one, version number two are too old. It's like they were created a month ago. They will never be accessed. So we can remove them. And they can be garbage collected. And uh, what is the time memory cost of such solution? It's proportional to the number of modified rows. So if we want to modify a single row, we create a single new version in contrast to persistent trees where where a single value update caused uh, us to copy algorithmic number of nodes, so it's better. However, let us see what happens with the consistency guarantees. The MVCC provides us with snapshot isolation uh, consistency guarantees. Transaction B, suppose we have transaction, two transactions, A and B. 
and transaction B will see writes performed by transaction A if and only if commit timestamp of A is less than, than start timestamp of B. So if transaction A committed before transaction B started, like uh, in the topmost picture. However, if transaction A started before transaction B, but committed later than transaction B started, neither A nor B will see uh, each other's rights. Uh, this consistency guarantees is called snapshot isolation. It's less strict than serializability because it allows some non-serializable execution. For example, it allows so-called rights queue. However, our reads will be consistent. So MCC is quite popular nowadays. It is used by almost any modern database, both SQL ones, no SQL ones, new SQL ones. Here is a short list. And here is a small reading list. Uh, the first paper is about a system developed at Google called Percolator. And it contains uh, a description of how MVCC is implemented in Google and how uh, transactions are implemented on top of the MVCC. Two materials about the uh, theoretical side of the MVCC and two materials about how MVCC can be implemented, is implemented in PostgreSQL. So we have discussed concurrency issues. Let us discuss data layout issues. Suppose we have a messenger database and uh, that stores sent messages and each message has four fields, sender ID, receiver ID, timestamp, and text. We can store data in either row or column-based format. What is a row-based format? It's a data layout in which first we store all columns of the first message, then all columns of the second message, then all columns of the third message, and so on. Uh, and in contrast, in column-based format, we store each column separately from other columns. Like for column sender ID, first we store sender of the first message, sender of the second message, sender of the third message, and so on. And uh, row order will be the same across all columns. So for each column, first we store column value for the first row, then column value of the second row, then column value of the third row, like here in the example. And which data layout is better? Consider a typical OLTP operation, fetch a single database row. It corresponds to a case when we want to uh, show the user one database object, like when we want to show the user one message from the database. We need to fetch a single row that corresponds to that message. So if our database is stored in a row-based format, first we perform a disk seek to jump to the place where that message starts, where the row starts. And with one big sequential read, we just read all the fields from that message. So looks quite simple. However, things are not that simple with column-based data. Uh, for example, uh, uh, first, all columns are stored separately. So we need to fetch them separately. First, we need to fetch sender ID, and we perform this seek to jump to a place where the value is stored, and we read it. After that, we uh, fetch timestamp. We jump. We perform this seek to jump to a place where that value starts, and read it. We do the same for receiver ID and text. And um, so instead of one disk seek plus one read, we have spent four disk seeks plus four reads. So for um, for row-based data, we spend one disk seek total to fetch the whole row. But for column-based data, we spend one disk seek per column. And if our row contains tens of columns, we will spend tens of disk seeks, uh, which is bad because disk seek is quite an expensive operation. Uh, so for uh, OLTP workload, row-based storage is better. And what about all of our clothes? Suppose we have a database of some internet shop and we have a table with payment data. And we want to calculate the following query. We want to uh, fetch all payment data during the last month. And for each region, we want to calculate total revenue, sum of prices of all goods sold in this region, like here. How can we execute it? Uh, if our data is uh, stored in row-based format, we perform disk seek to jump to the place where uh, the first row starts and begin reading all the rows we need. Each row can contain up to tens of columns. And uh, we need only three of them to execute the query. We need region, price, and timestamp. So we read all the columns of the row, but uh, use only three of them. So most, uh, so a lot of data, more than half of the data, is just thrown away. So we waste disk bandwidth. What about column-based storage? We can use the following algorithm. We allocate a RAM batch sufficient to fit n rows. N, be here, n can be here quite big, like in the order of thousand or tens of thousand or even more. And each row will contain only three columns, region, price, and timestamp. First, we read n uh, consecutive values of the region column, 
we perform disk seek to jump to the place where reading column starts and read first n values of the column and play them in the RAM batch. After that, we read n values of the price column, yet again with one disk seek, and put them in the RAM batch. We do the same thing with uh, for the uh, timestamp column, and after that the batch is collected. So to read a batch of like 10,000 rows, we have spent only three disk, disk six plus three sequential reads. Sounds quite good. Sounds uh, not very, uh, sounds cheap. And we don't waste disk bandwidth here because we need three columns. We read only three columns. No extra columns is read. Uh, so after that, we process the current batch. We calculate revenues by region of the current batch. So here we have two uh, regions, 42, uh, with revenue 424, with revenue 355. After that, we save somewhere current revenues and clear the RAM batch and start reading the second batch. So we read next and values of the region column, next and values of the price column, and so on until the next batch is read. After we read the next batch, we process it. We get partial revenues over the second batch. After that, we do the same thing with the third batch. We read it and process it with the fourth batch, with the fifth batch, and until we read all the data we need. After that, we can combine partial revenues calculated over distinct batches, like here. Uh, the combination method depends on the aggregation function we use. For some, it uh, for some for, for summing it will be uh, the, it will be one aggregation method. For average, it will be different aggregation method. For uh, minimum or maximum, it will be the short aggregation method, but we can still combine. And this algorithm is quite simple. We can apply more complex optimization here, like uh, co column storage allows us to employ, employ same devectorization to process uh, columns, and we can employ disk compilation to speed up our core execution, but that's not the point today. So, and um, uh, row-based storage and column-based storage are not the only two possible solutions. We can have we can store our data in column families. What is a column family? It's a data layout in which we store columns that were frequently accessed together alongside each other. For example, like here. We can have two, co two column families, first with uh, sender ID and receiver ID columns, and the second with column timestamp and text. And uh, how column families are stored separately, let's see how we store the first column family. First, we store sender and receiver of the first message, sender and receiver of the second message, sender and receiver of the third message, and so on. And yet again, row order is of course the same across all column families. Can column families speed up a query execution? Suppose we want to uh, execute the following query. For each user of our messenger, we want to calculate the number of uh, users he has sent messages to. So we execute the following query. To execute it, we need only two column, we need values of only two columns, sender ID and receiver ID. So we can read all the data we need with only one disk seek. We perform disk seek to jump to the place where the first column family starts and begin reading it with one big sequential read. And we read all the data we need. And we don't waste disk bandwidth because we need two columns, we read two columns. So to conclude, OLTP usually requires data to be stored in rows. OLAP usually requires data to be stored in columns. Some queries require our data to be stored in column families. But all aforementioned HTAP solutions represent OLAP and OLTP data in single format. Thus, we need to design a solution that will allow representing all up and LTP data in different data layouts. The first thing that comes into our mind is we can use separate nodes for all up and for LTP. Uh, suppose here we have two nodes that store copy of the same data, exact same data. First stores uh, call, first stores data by rows, and uh, LTP transactions executed on that node. The second uh, stores data in uh, by rows and it is used to execute all-up queries. For example, this approach is adopted by TIDB database. It's a modern new, new SQL fast database. And we can have more than two nodes. For example, we can have three nodes. The first node stores data yet again in row-based format. It's used for OLTP transactions. The second uh, node stores data in column-based column uh, format. It is used for all-up queries. The third node stores data in uh, in uh, column families, it is used for lab queries too. But the question is, how do we keep the data in sync between these uh, three nodes? 
let us study the answer. All OLAP queries are read-only. Thus, all updates are executed only on the first node. Thus, we should somehow find a way to synchronize updates performed on the, on the uh, OLTP node to send updates from the OLTP node to all the OLAP nodes. So, if the word replication comes to your mind, yes, that's exactly the replication. We have just reinvented the so-called leader-follower replication. Let's see how we can do it. We can do it using snapshots. Periodically, we make the full snapshot of the OLAP replica and send the snapshot to LT to all, all uh, we can periodically make a snapshot of the OLTP replica and send the snapshot to OLAP replicas. Uh, OLAP replicas receive the snapshot, they transform it from row-based data, data format to the data format they need. For example, it can be column family data format or, column or pure column data format and throw away the data they have and start using uh, the new snapshot. However, this, we have a problem here because uh, our database can be quite big, but database mostly consists of cold data that is never modified. And only a small part of database data is modified since the last uh, sync. So, but, but we uh, send all the data we have. So uh, there is a problem because we just waste network bandwidth to send data that has not changed. We should apply ca change data capture techniques to solve this problem. One example of such a technique is called log shipping. Each database may maintain and append only log of updates in order to provide rollbacks in case of a failure. And that log contains all updates applied to our system, both uh, updates to exi of existing rows and insertion of new rows. And um, so, so it contains all the updates and we can send the log, these log entries to all replicas. All app replicas receive uh, updates to the rows and uh, apply it locally. Uh, of course, it can uh, transform the data from row-based uh, data layout into column-based data layout. For example, the new row is transformed from row-based data layout into the column one. Uh, we have a, an append-only log, so new entries are only appended to the end of the log. And Existing log entries are immutable, so no log required to read them and ship them to all app replicas. So our all app replicas uh, execute updates in the same order as the OLTP replica and eventually it becomes synchronized with the OLTP replica. However, the solution has a drawback. Because suppose we have four uh, nodes, one for all app, one for OLTP, transactions and three for lab queries and thus we store four copies of the same data. Thus four times more memory is required to store our data. Can we design solutions that will store all data in only one copy but still will represent all up and LP data in different layouts? Let us see. To design the solution first we need to get familiar with so-called log structured merge tree or LSM tree. Suppose we have a sorted key value map in RAM. When the map overflows, we dump it to the disk as an immutable sorted sequence, like here. And RAM map is made empty. Updates continue being inserted into the RAM map without modifying the disk. The disk is immutable. For example, when you want to add new key value pair to the system, to the to the map, we add it to we insert it to the RAM map. When we want to change a value associated with some given key, some existing key. We insert new, we insert this key value pair to the RAM map. Of course, uh, the RAM map can overflow one more time. In this case, we will create the second on disk sorted sequence. And yet again, we make the RAM map empty. After that, uh, of course, it can overflow the third, the fourth time, and on each overflow, we create one uh, immutable on disk sorted block. Let us see how, in, how we can implement, how we can read from such a structure. Suppose we want to execute point query. So we want to find a value associated with a given key. We have multiple data structures here. We have a single RAM map and multiple on disks sorted uh, blocks. And the, 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 the topmost block, the first block, contains results of the most recent flush. So it contains most, the most recent data in our, uh, and the second. Mm, the, the, the second 
block that is a bit lower contains the result of with all the flush and it contains a bit all the data. And the last block that is the lowest contains the result of the oldest flush. It contains the oldest data. And the same key may exist in both in RAM map and in uh, thumb uh, and in some uh, on disk blocks. And we should find and which value should be return of all this uh, key of all these entries. For example, key two exists in both the RAM map and in one of the blocks, and with different values, of course. And we can return the value found in the topmost structure because it is the most recent value. For example, key two exists in the RAM map and in the lowest block. We return the value from the RAM map because it's more recent. Key six exists both in the RAM map and in the um, topmost block. We return the value from the RAM map because it's more recent. Value five exists both in the RAM map and oh, so sorry, sorry, value five exists both in the top block and in the lower block. And we to get the value from the top block because it's more recent. And how do we implement range queries? Range query is a query that returns all keys from the range from min to max along with the most recent value for each key. How can we implement it? In each sequence, we find first key that is greater than or equal than min. We can find oh, we can find that using binary search. Uh, uh, I forgot to say, uh, we can find each uh, a key in the sorted sequence using binary search. So we apply binary search here. And uh, let's return the to range queries. After that, we have k sorted sequences. And to form a result, we merge them, discarding outdated values. Uh, for example, key 5 exists both in the topmost block and in the middle block, and we get the value from the topmost block because it's more recent. The value from the middle block is discarded. So merging k sorted sequences is quite well known algorithm. It's called k, k by merge or heap merge, and uh, it's well known. So this is, this is how range queries can be implemented. Remember that we want to support reading without locks. How do we implement it in LSM tree? Note that only disk state of the system consists of a set of immutable blocks, and readers acquire a set of blocks, a set current set of on disk blocks, and after that, readers read uh, read from blocks without locks because blocks are immutable. Of course, to execute a transaction, readers may need to use locks, for example, to work with a RAM map. However, uh, all work with the disk happens completely without locks. So LSM tree is um, it is concurrency friendly data structure. LSM tree is quite popular nowadays. It is adopted by many by many uh, by many modern databases. It is uh, adopted by many uh, modern um, by, by many modern um, uh, engines for storing data like RocksDB and LevelDB. So. Here we have a problem here. Suppose the number of uh, on disk sorted blocks becomes very big, like we can have millions of blocks, because the number of blocks only grows. And old blocks contain outdated values that are always discarded. Like consider this example here. The oldest block contains uh, key 7, and the uh, topmost block contains key 7. The value from the, top, from the lowest block is almost discarded on any read query. Thus, it just wastes disk space. This is the first problem. The second problem is the following. To find a key, we may have to look in each sorted block. So if we have a million of blocks, we have to look uh, for the value in million of blocks. So we, can, we might have to perform up to million of binary searches. And uh, thus, our queries will be inefficient because million binary search will be very slow. And what can we do? For the, uh, to deal with this situation. We should somehow keep the number of blocks low. We can, uh, we can choose two blocks and merge them, discarding outdated values. Uh, in this case, we'll, we will make the number of blocks less, uh, we'll decrease the number of blocks by one. And we can reclaim the space occupied by the outdated values, and we keep the number of uh, blocks low uh, to keep the number of binary searches low. Merge happens in the background, and the merge latency almost doesn't affect request latency. Of course, it's affected it in practice because merge consumes some uh, system resources, like merge consumes some disk bandwidth, but merge happens in the background and is done by background threads. Thus, merge latency doesn't affect request latency directly. 
So multiple merge strategy can exist uh, for the lesson tree. We will consider leveling strategy. Uh, the data is divided into multiple levels. The level zero, the topmost level, contains the most recent data. Level one, it's a bit lower, it contains a bit more older data. And the last level, the lowest level, level number n, contains the oldest data. We, can, we will choose level i and merge it into the level number i plus one. Uh, after that, level number i plus one will contain keys from both levels and level number i will be uh, empty. Uh, this leveling stra this strategy help us keep the following invariant. Uh, if the same key with different values exist in, the, in some top block and in some lower block, then value from the higher block is, mo is always more up to date. Thus, when uh, doing some read from the data structure, we should always discard value from bottom levels and take values from top levels. Uh, it's quite, uh, it's very convenient to work with such an invariant. And uh, let us see how an object behaves uh, in our system. First, new object is inserted to the RAM map. Eventually, it is flushed to the level zero. After some time, it is flushed to level one. After some time, it is merged into the level two. So, objects are propagated to lower levels over time. Thus, the lower the level, the older the data it contains. We can use such a property to implement time-based HTAP. Consider classifying a uh, web service. It is a web service in which uh, users create advertisement about the goods they want to sell. And, and recent advertisement are hot data, because such advertisement that we created like 10 minutes ago, uh, one hour ago, are shown to users, because we want to show to the users recent advertisement. We want users to buy the goods from that recent advertisement. And recent advertisements are, of course, modified because the user that created it, the owner, may change the text of the advertisement, it may change photos, it may change the other content. We may increment the number of people that watch it or that have uh, looked at this advertisement and so on. So recent advertisements are accessed OLTP style and Recent advertisements are the advertisements that are stored on the top level of the LSM tree. Thus, data in the top level of the LSM tree will be stored in pure row-based format. Rows will be sorted by some primary key. For example, for the classified uh, web service, advertising web service, we can use um, uh, primary key, owner ID, and publication timestamp. Let us look at the bottom level. Bottom level contains the oldest advertisement in the system that we created like five years ago, seven years ago. These advertisements are not shown to users because the goods from the advertisement, from old advertisement, have been already sold. We don't want to show them to users. But we may still want to calculate some statistical aggregation over such outdated advertisement. For example, we may want to know how fast an average advertisement on our site is closed by region. And uh, thus, Old advertisement are accessed all up style. Thus, and old advertisement are stored in the bottom level of the LSM tree. Thus, data in the bottom level will be stored in pure column based data format. Uh, yet again, of course, row order will be the same for all columns, and the order will be determined by the same primary key. Yet again, it will be owner ID and publication timestamp, like key and the example. And what about middle levels? We can use arbitrary column families on middle levels. For example, we can configure storage layout separately for each level in the middle, and we can configure it based on the access pattern to that level. So we can change uh, some level of the lesson tree, see which queries we execute on the rows from that level, and choose the data layout to better fit that access pattern. Yet again, of course, row order yet again will be the same for all column families, uh, and it will be determined by the primary key, the same primary key, owner ID and publication timestamp, and uh, the same logic can be applied to other services as well. For example, it can be applied to uh, photo or post storage in a social network. It can be applied to message storage. It can be applied to financial transaction storage. Uh, recent data is modified and accessed via point queries. But old data is uh, read in uh, big batches. And the older data, the, the bigger the batch we want to uh, read. So. Uh, Data on different uh, levels stored in different data layouts. For example, 
Uh, and how, how do we change a layout of uh, a particular row? In fact, we will uh, when we uh, merge level number E, level number I into the level number Apple I plus one, we will uh, change the layout of the level being merged. For example, here we want to merge level number zero that stores data in pure row based format into the level number one that stores data in uh, column family format. So we divide the whole row uh, from level zero into smaller column families and merge it. Like uh, here in the example, consider the, the next example. First, we want to uh, merge level one that stores data in column uh, family based data layout into the, the level two, the storage data in pure based in column in pure column based data layout. Uh, we divide each column family from level uh, two from level one into individual columns when merging, like here in the example. Uh, this scheme can be extended a bit. For example, if our data is partitioned according to some criteria, not only by time, like in the LSM tree, but by uh, s s by, but by arbitrary criteria, like here, we partition our data according to region and year. And if our data if, if our data partitions are stored separately, for each separate partition, we can configure separately data layout, compression scheme, and other things that re that are related to how a partition is stored. For example, database called Hyper adopts such a scheme. It configures a storage, a storage layout and compression scheme per partition. So here is a small reading list. A paper about TIDB that uses separate computing nodes for a LAPO and LTP. Uh, here we have a paper that presents the idea of the LSM tree. Here we have a paper that presents the idea that on different levels of the LSM tree, we can have uh, different data layouts. And this paper presents a very interesting idea too. It presents the idea that if we know um, access pattern to our data, we can now, we can analytically determine which data layout will fit the pattern best. Of course, uh, it, it contains a lot of uh, some creepy formulas, but it, it definitely worth reading. And this paper presents the idea that we can configure uh, that we can configure data layout and compression scheme per partition. So that's all. Thanks for your question. And uh, of course, all the questions you have, you may ask them, and we will dis uh, discuss them in, uh, during the discussion. Okay. Oh, thank you for your talk, Ilya. Thank you for listening. <laughs> yeah, you managed to cover so many complex ideas and you managed to explain it in such an approachable way. Yeah, I, I hope uh, our, um, our guests, our listeners uh, understand the ideas I've t t told about. Yeah, we, we will discuss them in all the questions in the discussion zone and we don't have my, much time left. Yeah. I just wanted to clarify something uh, yeah, please join the discussion. We will be we will be there uh, very soon. Yeah, and my, uh, just one thing: uh, parallel batching you described uh, reminded me about right ahead lock optimizations, and all, all these tricks I used. Like you just delay these rights to to accumulate. Yeah, some yeah. Uh, of course, uh, the problem what Dimo is talking about is the following. When we uh, each database should maintain and uh, write uh, write a head log before uh, writing some row to the database, we uh, we write it to some log. And if the database fails, we can replace the log and restore the database state before the be, before the crash, before the hardware failure. And but uh, writing uh, each but, but writing each transaction to disk is. Uh, is not very time efficient because it requires a disk flash and it's a costly operation. So we can, uh, so so we can collect a batch of transaction and batch uh, and and after that uh, write a batch of transaction to the disk at once. Mm -hmm. So we uh, s some kind of uh, distribute the load over uh, multiple transactions, and one transaction and when one transaction becomes be becomes not so costly. So yeah, batching is a very popular technique in programming. If uh, your data access is, is not so fast, uh, try to use batching. Um, and of course, batching and caching are ideas that that, that I think can be um, can be seen in each and every uh, in each and every system used by programmers. Yeah, they are ubiquitous. 
Um, yeah, yeah, they, they all miss you because uh, yeah. batching allocation, that's uh, all programmers need. Uh -huh. And uh, one last question, we still have 20 seconds. Like, what do you like the most, MVCC or Persistent or LSM? Uh, it, it's, 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 it's always um, some trade-off because, for example, MVCC uh, allows us to, um, allows better parallelism than, uh, allows better con con concurrency than, uh, the, than the um, than the persistent trees, and it uses less memory because uh, for one for yeah. single value yeah. updates, you uh, create a copy of only one um, uh, memory cell, but it uh, uses uh, less strict uh, consistency guarantee. And uh, in the solution, writers can block readers, but we, in the solution with um, persistent trees, writers cannot block readers. Mm -hmm. So it's it's always a trade off. Yeah, it's always depend. Why we have so many databases in modern world? Because you have a great variety of uh, data. You have a great variety of uh, different uh, access patterns. So you see which access pattern you have, and you uh, choose the database and the algorithm accordingly to the uh, to the access pattern you have. So. I think uh, we may say goodbye. And uh -huh. We are not saying goodbye. We will join the discussion zone soon. So yeah, yeah and please are... rate the talk. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, please rate the talk and, uh, and join us. Yeah, in the discussion zone. We, we, we will join the discussion soon. So yeah. bye. See you in a minute. See, see you. See you. Goodbye. Bye.